Always to We ask the questions. What is needed in the world? Maroš Ševčović, podpredsjednik je Europske komisije. Iza sebe ima nekoliko mandata u toj Europskoj instituciji u Briselu. Europska komisija sada ga je zadužila za uspostavljanje energetske unije, čiji je cilj između ostaloga povezivanje infrastrukture, sprečavanje energetske nestašice, diversifikacija izvora i smanjivanje energetske ovisnosti. Govori o utjecaju novih planova iz Brisela na zemlje naše regije, ali i o tome je li nakon propalog projekta Južni tok Projekt Njemačke i Rusije, nazvan Sjeverni tok 2, u skladu s evropskim pravilima ili ne. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for joining us. Um, the Commission recently adopted the Security of Energy Supply package. Um, it is supposed to improve the resilience. So just to begin with, can you tell us how resilient the EU is? I think it's much better than it was in 2009, for example, when uh, quite a few uh, countries, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, suffered a lot from this complete cut-off of uh, supply uh, of the gas, uh, gas from the East. And uh, therefore we did our stress test, uh, which we completed the last year. And it was quite clear that uh, uh, we can cope with the situation much better that the EU would manage even uh, six months uh, of, uh, uh, of interrupted supply. But, uh, of course, uh, it varies a little bit from the countries to the country. So, to be quite open still, some of the Central and Eastern European countries are more vulnerable than the countries in the uh, West of Europe. Therefore, we came up with the security of supply package where we have to improve the situation further. Because the EU still imports a lot of energy it consumes, so the stress tests also show that, bottom line, the EU is still vulnerable. I think we, it's, it's clear that we are the biggest energy importer in the world. I mean, every day we pay more than 1 billion of euros for, for energy imports. And, of course, if it comes to gas, more than half of uh, all the gas we consume in Europe is imported. So we uh, need uh, uh, to make sure that our supplies are secure, are reliable. And, of course, what we would like to see that also the gas we buy is uh, sold to the Europeans at affordable price. I always tell to our suppliers, but we are such a good customer. We buy a lot, we pay on time, we pay in hard currency, so we, of course, want to get the good uh, service. But to guarantee that you need to have uh, a diversif diversified uh, supplier portfolio, and that was one of the goals which we presented uh, when we uh, proposed this new security of supply package. So lots of money still goes into the energy. What's the plan? How, what is the EU Commission proposing? How to fix it? I think we have uh, we made several proposals. The first one was that we really need to complete uh, the internal energy market, meaning the single market uh, for, for energies, that we would really have this free flow of energies across the Europe. For that, we need better infrastructure. We need better interconnections. At the same time, we want to open Europe uh, to LNG. Uh, that's a new phenomenon on the global commodity markets. We expect that within the next uh, five years, uh, more than 50% of uh, new LNG supplies would enter into the global market. And we see that uh, uh, price-wise, the pipeline gas and LNG-wise, uh, they are now uh, very close to each other. And uh, uh, we know that uh, very important players like United States, Australia or Canada are entering this market. So we think that uh, we should open Uh, the possibility to use more LNG in Europe because we believe that it could be a good uh, diversification. Just talking about LNG, uh, what kind of role will Western Balkans region have? Here specifically I think of Croatia, there is one LNG terminal to be built. Um, and what are the expectations of the Commission regarding Croatia's plan to yeah. build? I think that we also with this LNG strategy try to be very practical. So it means that uh, it's rather a short document, but what you, uh, what, you f uh, what you can find there is that we are focusing very much on the key infrastructural uh, projects. Uh, so of course Kirk uh, LNG terminal is, is one of them. And uh, what we want to achieve is that through the interconnections between our uh, gas systems in Europe, we want to make sure that every single member state would have access to the LNG and uh, that every single member state would have access to at least three different sources of gas. So we would avoid the situation where the countries, which have been very much dependent on one supplier, simply paid more for the gas. Because I was also quite surprised when I saw the figures that in 2014, still the Central and Eastern Europeans have been paying 24% more than the uh, Western partners, and the last year it was still 16% of a difference. And 
mostly it's uh, because of the fact that Western European countries have, uh, are better interconnected, they have much more liquid market and I think that we have to learn from that and make sure that in Central, Eastern Europe and in Western Balkans we would have the same quality of interconnections. South Stream was cancelled though, there have been uh, quite some controversies, especially in the aftermath now regarding the Nord Stream 2 project to simplify connecting Germany and uh, Russia. Um, has the EU Commission taken a stand on the Nord Stream 2? I think we are, uh, we are uh, studying the, the materials we have at our disposal and to be quite honest it's still not that much because we do not have uh, all, that, uh, all the details. So we are of course studying the legal ramification but also the political aspects of this project because uh, um, the Nord Stream was debated at several occasions at the level of foreign ministers, uh, energy ministers. It was taken up by the heads of state and government in December. And if I have to sum up uh, the, uh, the current assessment, I think it's quite clear that uh, what is very important for the uh, European uh, Commission, not only that the European law is uh, fully respected uh, in this project, but also that we need to look for the comprehensive solution which would uh, improve the energy security for all member states. And therefore, I think we need uh, uh, to study how much gas Europe really needs. Now we presented our assessment, how much gas the, uh, Europe would consume in 2030. And then, of course, to look for the most cost-efficient uh, and uh, uh, most, uh, uh, most reliable ways how to transport the gas uh, from all directions, including from Russia, into the European Union. You mentioned you still don't have all information needed. You're studying uh, what you have. Uh, what's the hold-up? Who's stalling? I think that uh, if uh, so far I think what uh um, uh, we know about this project is mostly uh, the information we get uh, we get from the press. So I think that also consortium is also studying uh, how to uh, proceed. I think that uh, it's it's very clear that the legal analyses are going not only uh, are being made not only in the Commission but also in the, in the member states and I believe on the side uh, of uh, the the consortium because of course. Uh, uh, the project of such a magnitude would have a very direct impact on overall, galance, uh, over, overall gas balance in, in Europe and especially in, in Central Europe. And I think that uh, when discussing Nord Stream we cannot forget about Ukraine because this is a very crucial uh, uh, issue. The transit route through Ukraine was serving as well for, for decades. It's the biggest one. And uh, of course, it's a very important uh, source of revenue uh, for the Ukrainian government, which goes through a rather difficult uh, moment. So therefore, I think that in any um, uh, reflections on this project, uh, we need to uh, clearly bear this in mind. And it's not only the vision of the Commission, foreign ministers, heads of state and government, all of them concluded that these routes through Ukraine uh, should, be, should be preserved, should be maintained. And therefore, I think to, uh, we have to look for the solution which is based on how much gas do we really need in Europe, what are the prospects, and we offered very concrete figures, and uh, how uh, can we maintain the transit through Ukraine, and, and then what needs to be done next. So I hope that we will get into this a new debate where we will be working more with the concrete facts, demands, and also the political circumstances uh, around this project. Because there were some member states already saying that they are against or not happy with the idea of Nord Stream uh, 2. Some of them even labeled Germany by having a double standard, so to say, especially in the aftermath of South Stream being cancelled. So just on the first look of it, what is your impression? What's your opinion? Is Nord Stream 2 as a project in line with EU legislation? I think what we, what we have said uh, that uh, we see the Nord Stream project as not in conformity with the energy union objectives because we, uh, we clearly uh, declared that we want to diversify, so it means we, we need uh, new routes, uh, new sources, and um, uh, this is not the project uh, which is in that category. Therefore, we also said quite clearly that uh, there cannot be any expectations that, for example, European funds could be used for, uh, for construction or feasibility studies of this project. If it comes to the legal aspects, uh, of course, there it's another issue because you need much more concrete uh, uh, um, uh, information on how this should be built, who will form the consortium, how the transmission is uh, supposed uh, to take place. So it's a lot of very specific issues and there we do not have uh, uh, all information and therefore we are in uh, close contact with the German regulator.
So talking about the security of uh, supply, uh, we are pretty much hearing about the European solution, solution for the European Union, but how does it all translate into non-European uh, countries, that is non-European mm. Union countries, so for example, specifically Western Balkans? I think that I uh, said it already several times that uh, if it comes to the energy union, it doesn't stop at the EU border, because I know that uh, especially energy community countries, Western Balkan countries, uh, Moldova, uh, Ukraine, they are very much uh, interested in uh, being closely associated and integrated into the energy union and I think it's very logical conclusions because if it comes to the electricity flows or if it comes to the gas interconnection it's quite clear that uh, if uh, something happens uh, um, to your neighbor you are affected and therefore um, uh, the Western Balkans being in a, in, a, in a heart of Europe it's quite clear uh, that they concerns but also their plans uh, must be taken into account when we are planning all these infrastructural projects and and I think it was uh, quite well reflected in the work we did together on so-called uh, KESEC initiative I mean that's abbreviation which stands for connectivity North, connectivity of South East and Central uh, Europe because uh, there I think we, we managed to replace that uh, um, uh, the traditional approach of uh, mega projects coming into the region and solving all the problems by the series of uh, um, more very concrete uh, interconnector projects which uh, I think would do even better service to the region because they would increase liquidity, they will bring versatility, they will bring bi-directional flows and, and make sure that each of these countries would have access to different uh, sources of uh, of, of gas supply and and I think that uh, we been working together very well within very short period of time something like three months we agreed on this uh, key uh, projects for gas now we are implementing them and I would like to extend the same type of cooperation also to the electricity because it's very clear that in that field the, the cooperation uh, would be also very much needed. So it seems like that Western Balkans, for example, is gaining something from the EU, from European, from energy union uh, ideas. But what are obligations? Uh, so things need to be in line with the EU standards. Are Western Balkans country able at this point to meet the obligations? Yeah. Coming back to what, what they gain, except that or beyond what I believe would be uh, uh, better energy security, but uh, also uh, I hope very soon more competition on the market, which should result in, in better price for the consumers. Uh, they're also gaining the financial support because I remember very well when we had this Western Balkan summit in uh, Vienna, which should now take place in, in Paris. Uh, uh, there was offer of one uh, billion of euros of support for this uh, energy infrastructural uh, projects, and I think it would help a lot to improve the infrastructure in the, in the Western Balkans. If it comes to the obligation, uh, so in uh, this case the energy community uh, uh, countries uh, are gradually adopting the, the EU legislation and energy community secretariat is helping them through the I would say, expert advice uh, through some legislative uh, assistance and uh, I know from my own experience that when we in the pre-accession time as uh, Slovakia have been preparing ourselves for the membership into the EU, we also had to change the, the, the whole legislation and transpose the EU legislation into the Slovak national order. And it helped us tremendously because you modernize your legal order, you have a standard legislation as it is in Western European countries, so it's much easier for investors, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, ma much easier for uh, economic operators. And, I think this is the best way how we are gradually preparing the Western Balkans for eventual membership into the EU. And with all the problems we are hearing, rule of law, uh, corruption uh, and so on, you think they are ready at this point? I think, of, of course, uh, each country is different and, uh, and uh, they, are, they are progressing. And for that, I think we have uh, very well established the accession process, which is, uh, um, I would say, much more thorough than it was with us, to be quite honest, I think, because uh, now uh, when it comes to the accession talks, I mean, we introduced the system of uh, benchmark for opening the chapters, benchmark for closing the, the, the chapters. Uh, in our case, I would say the intention to adopt the law was enough. Now we are waiting until the laws are not only approved, but implemented. So uh, it's, it's much more demanding, the accession process. But in the, in the end, as a, as a result of this uh, uh, accession, uh, 
uh, preparation uh, is that uh, the new member states are much better prepared than let's say our group of the member states was at that time so I think that it's it's mutually beneficial and once uh, they will be joining I'm sure they will be very well prepared one of the elements of the uh, security of supply package is also transparency of intergovernmental uh, agreements can you explain us a little bit what is that all about I think you uh, mentioned already the South Stream so I think that uh, that was uh, uh, that was uh, the the, the issue which uh, uh, made it very clear that we need to learn from uh, all the circumstances around this project and what we wanted to make sure is that in the future we would avoid the situation where intergovernmental contracts are negotiated, signed, ratified and then we discover that they are in the breach of the EU law. So now what uh, we are proposing is that uh, once uh, uh, EU member state decides that they want to conclude the intergovernmental agreement with the third, part, third party, they should uh, notify the European Commission, keep us informed. We are offering our presence as observers in the, in the negotiating team. We are proposing to have this final check uh, on, on uh, the EU compatibility of this uh, agreement. Uh, and uh, by this we hope that we would avoid the situation that once these agreements are ratified later on only, uh, we discovered that they are in the breach of the EU law. We believe that it will bring more transparency, it will bring more respect for the EU law, and uh, at the same time it would give that additional assurance to the investors that there will be no legal problems in, in the future, and once as this deal is signed, it's fully compatible with the European legal order. It seems, though, that it's awakening quite some controversy uh, among member states, or is it maybe just media? But do you think it's justified, like questions as if uh, business uh, uh, confidentiality, uh, questions of sovereignty? I think if it comes to intergovernmental agreements, uh, uh, we had a very clear conclusion uh, coming from the heads of state and government from the December of the last uh, year, where they've been clearly calling for the uh, for the uh, better transparency and for compatibility of uh, these agreements with the, with the EU law. So um, I, I presume that the proposal we put on the table is going exactly in the line as the heads of state and government wanted us to go. I understand that there is some preoccupation with our proposal for uh, transparency of the commercial contracts, because there we suggest that uh, the contracts with uh, uh, duration of more than one year and uh, covering the supply to one concrete member state uh, in the proportion of more than 40% uh, of the market should be automatically notified to the European Commission. And uh, we suggested that this could be clearly done in a way that we would fully respect the confidentiality and sensitivity of this information. We specified what kind of data we would need about this contract and we also said why we need it. We need it uh, 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 primarily because of the security of uh, supply assessment, because we have to work with the so-called N-1 scenario. What does it mean? It means that uh, we need to plan what will happen to that country and to that region if this major supplier, who is supplying more than 40% of supply, suddenly is not in the position to offer the same service. What would happen to the country? What would happen to the region? And we had such a situation in the past, therefore we want to be much better prepared for the future. So I hope that uh, this would be reassuring uh, to our commercial operators that we are not going to snoop about the prices, we are not going to uh, invade into the, the, the commercial com uh, confidentiality, but we are actually offering them uh, reassurance that uh, the contingency plans which would be drawn now, not on national, but on territorial, regional uh, level, that actually they would guarantee that there would be adequate uh, supplies of uh, gas coming under any of uh, uh, foreseen circumstances. Now, I, I know the Commission doesn't like hypothetical questions, but what if the Commission says, OK, this commercial contract is not in line? What kind of consequences are there? Do, does the country then need to continue negotiating? Or what if it's then left without anything because maybe the commercial partner will not want to I think uh, continue? There are two different approaches. I mean, if it comes to the intergovernmental agreements, there we have a, 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 clear, uh, a, a clear line on this one that uh, 
if uh, we uh, found that this uh, uh, draft agreement is in the breach of the, of the European law, we have to inform the member states and if uh, member state uh, doesn't take uh, our opinion into, into account, we can start uh, the infringement, meaning that we uh, will have to take the case into the European Court of Justice. If it comes to the commercial contract, there we are not going to uh, study uh, the, the legal side of, this, of these contracts because this is covered by commercial law. Uh, what we are uh, going to study there is the implication of uh, this contract on the energy security of that country, of that region. So we would like to know what are the conditions of the contract's entry, exit points, uh, what are the clauses for, uh, let's say, penalties of uh, uh, interrupted supply. So we, we really know under what uh, kind of conditions uh, this uh, critical mass of supply is, is delivered to the country so we can plan for the situations of emergencies where this uh, scenario, where this biggest supplier is not in a position to supply the gas, how to help that country and how to uh, prepare the, the whole region for such eventuality. So um, to switch to the heating and cooling yeah. as well a little bit and to renewables. What's the strategy plan when we talk about renewables? Uh, especially it's interesting for the Western Balkans, uh, not only for our viewers, but only because geographically it's in good position, coastal area, there's lots of sun, lots of wind. On the other hand, there are some political problems mm. as well. So. Um, What's the strategy there for renewables specifically? Yeah, I think in Western Balkans very often we, uh, we forget to, to mention uh, hydro potential Western Balkans have because it's really something uh, uh, which the Western Balkans are blessed with, uh, a lot of hydro energy which is uh, very powerful, which is, which is very clean and where, I'm, where I know that uh, quite a few investors would be very keen to look uh, into that potential. But then if it comes to the uh, renewable sources like uh, like wind and, and, and solar. Again, I think that uh, Western Balkans are very well situated because of a uh, good geographical, uh, geographical location. So what uh, we plan here is that this year we are going to adopt new electricity market design and also new uh, directive on renewables to make sure that uh, the renewables are better integrated uh, into the uh, electricity uh, market design and that we also take into account uh, uh, the maturity of these technologies because we see that uh, uh, for example, uh, wind turbines uh, built onshore, they are already in many countries fully competitive and uh, with the traditional sources. Uh, the same uh, I can say about photovoltaic uh, panels and, uh, and the solar, solar energy. So we see that also member states are now thinking how to um, financially support them. Is it still necessary? Can they divert that financial support to some other uh, measures to make sure that we would uh, uh, hit uh, the targets for, for 2020 and 2030 in this, uh, in this climate uh, area? And I think that for the Western Balkan countries what would be uh, very good and useful if they would learn from uh, our experience, positive and negative, and uh, uh, looking at the results from Paris, I think it's quite clear that uh, the world global community decided to go on this decarbonization path that each uh, country would have to go uh, through this decoupling, as, as Europe has already done, of uh, increased growth, but uh, lowered uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And um, Western Balkan countries are, I think, quite lucky that they are on the European continent where we can share uh, the best practices, we can share the technology, and we can also share the, the renewable energy. So what I think would be the most useful in Western Balkan countries to do the same, what we are now asking from our member states, to look at all that legislative framework which we are going to put on the table this year and then to draw their national energy and climate plans, how they want to fit in the energy union, how they want to meet the targets for, for 2030 and to have such a healthy debate about it within their own country, with stakeholders, with the citizens, because the transition has to take place. And of course, uh, uh, we should do everything possible um, to do it with the support of our citizens. But what we see in practice are plans for new thermal power plants to be built, 
high coal usage, we see air pollution again this uh, winter, um, a lot of electricity being used for cooling during the summer, um, and it's quite a long-term planning again. So how do you yeah. see these two going I together? think, of course, the, 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 the major uh, issue here is to uh, set the right price for carbon. And uh, you see the, the, the countries which have uh, been very successful in, uh, in, in, the, in this transition, that uh, uh, they combine the emission trading system, which is there for the whole Europe, with some additional uh, carbon, carbon pricing. So they've been promoting these new technologies and they've been phasing out gradually such a carbon-intensive uh, 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 fuel like, like coal. And uh, uh, that's something what I think we need to do on the European wide level. We adopted last year so-called market stability reserve, which is withdrawing from the current emission trading 800 million allowances, uh, uh, which been uh, uh, estimated uh, that they are in excess. And we already uh, changed and amended our proposal for post-2020 period to reflect this new reality and new goals for uh, 2030. So we believe that carbon uh, uh, carbon price uh, uh, would reflect much better the uh, polluter pays uh, principle, and that carbon price would reflect uh, really much better the the reality of uh, how the, the the carbon is harming the environment. And then, of course, we we want to establish much stronger global system. So we hope that China. Uh, will introduce their own emission trading system as of 2017. We are in close contact with our Chinese partners. We offered a lot of technical experience. We know that such a, uh, systems are working in Quebec, in Ontario, in Manitoba, in California, where they are already trading among themselves, in South Korea. So I think that uh, if we would have these uh, three big uh, economies, European, Chinese, part of North American, South Korean, systems uh, being much better linked together, that we could see some ingredient for the global carbon price setting mechanism, which I think would be the, the, the best solution how to tackle the problem of the fair carbon pricing. Lots of the ideas, lots of plans. Let's hope it all works. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much.